Have you found Hebrews chapter 11 yet? Yes. All right, we're going to begin reading here again in verse, fir- in, in verse 1. We started last week and we went through the first three verses. We're going to take this a verse at a time because we continue to see this phrase, by faith. Now we see in verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 11, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Last week we began to talk about what faith is and how it works. And as we look at this hall of faith that we call Hebrew, or that the Scripture uh, refers to as Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to see how faith did some impossible things, and how through faith and by faith, many, many uh, hopeless situations were turned around. Precedents were set as a result of things that men did, and the Holy Ghost has seen fit to record them for us so that we can, by faith, follow in their footsteps. The first thing we looked at here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, that I want to remind you of, is that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That for which you hope does not mean that which you idly dream or have a fantasy about. It's not just trying to dream something weird up and give substance to it. These hopes that it speaks of in Hebrews chapter 11, 1 are actual realities. They are promises that have been made to God's people. And they exist. We here in this earth, we are limited by four dimensions. Three spatial dimensions and one dimension we call time. Length, height, width, and time. Physicists refer to it as the space-time continuum. No true physicist will ever refer to uh, uh, the three dimensions of space without including the fourth dimension of time. And it's because we as natural beings are limited to these four dimensions. We cannot operate outside as human beings, as natural beings, outside the realm of these three dimensions and the fourth dimension of time. But God is not limited to these things. God dwells where there is no time and where there are no limitations. He's not limited by these four dimensions. And God has things already prepared and made ready for us. God has completed some things. And and the reality is that one of these days, If you're a believer, you're going to experience every one of them. You're going to know what it is to walk free of care. You're going to know what it is to walk free of sickness and disease. You're going to know what it is to walk free of death. You're going to know what it is to have every desire fulfilled. You're going to know what it is to live the abundant life. The only question is, when? When are you going to experience these things? Are you going to experience these things like so many do when you get to heaven? Are you going to experience many of them, perhaps the bulk of them, when you have left this life and entered into that realm? Or are you going to, by faith, possess that which already belongs to you? That's what your faith is for. I quote dear brother Lester Sumrall, who shared one time talking about faith, and he talked about the things that you want, the things that you desire, and the things that you need. He said, that's what your faith is for. Your faith is not to be enshrined. It's not to be put on a pedestal. It's not to be, you know, encased and, and, and spotlighted. Your faith is there to get you what you need, hope for, and desire. Amen. Glory to God. And so we see then that faith gives substance to the things that we hope for. These things are already a material, a heavenly material reality. But faith will, call, will give substance to them and make them an earthly material reality. And then we see in verse 3, the first elder that he mentions here is God Himself. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Now again that word, word there is the word rhema, or H-E-M-A. It's a Greek word which means the spoken word. And it distinguishes uh, this this, uh, word from logos which is the living word or the complete word. But a rhema is a spoken word of God. And God created, God framed the worlds and made things which are seen out of things which do not appear by His spoken word. God said 
and it was so. We looked in the book of Genesis. So we see here that God, the first elder, gives us the, the launch, the launching point, and the understanding of how faith works. Faith works by saying. Everybody say this, Jesus said, I have what I say. The Bible teaches that I have what I say. Now this goes right along with what we're theming this year, or in part theming, planting flowers. Living in this realm of planting flowers. When you sow a seed, you're going to reap a harvest. If you plant a flower seed, you're going to get flowers. Well, that is exactly akin to the process of sowing the Word of God and reaping the harvest from it. So if I sow seeds of healing, health, and strength, I have, it is not possible but that I receive a harvest of these things, healing, health, and strength. If I sow seeds of increase, it is not possible that I not have a harvest of increase. Amen. And so this is what we mean by planting flowers. We're sowing for those things which we desire, which we want to have, instead of what the world and the dummies that run it decide they want us to have. Satan operates full time trying to decide and impose on you what he wants you to have. The whole world system operates in this direction to impose upon you, to control you, and to give you what they think you need and they think what, that you ought to have. And it is, the, it is a demonic system, it is ungodly, and God has given us something to go way around it, glory to God, and come out on the other side even better. Now, verse 4. Let's go into our next, our next elder. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Amen. All right, now let's talk here about Abel. In order to discuss this, we need some backstory. So let's go back to the book of Genesis again. Genesis chapter 1 is where we found the elder God and his uh, expression of faith. When we get over into chapter 3, we begin to learn of this next uh, elder that Hebrews 11 tells us about. Now in chapter 4 is where we're going to see the actual transaction that we read about in Hebrews 11. But we need some backstory. We need to go back to chapter 3. In chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth. It gives us a, an overview of the seven, six days of creation and the, and the last day of rest. Then in chapter 2, it gives us a little bit more insight and gives us a little bit more detail, particularly about the creation of man and woman. It tells us that God uh, fashioned a garden. Uh, we know it as the Garden of Eden. And He prepared it for His man. And then He made His man. And man is a three-part being, just like God. And He fashioned His body out of the dust or the dirt or the elements, if you will, of this planet. Your body is made up of the same stuff that everything else is made of. It's made up out of the same stuff that that pew is made of. It's made up of the same, of the same stuff that this pulpit or this carpet is. It's, it's, it's all natural material. But the part that we read about God creating with His Word was the spirit of man. The Bible says it like this. Chapter 2 says, And God breathed into Adam the breath of life, or literally the spirit of life. So God fashioned His body. I suppose He used His hands because the Scripture tells us that He fashioned it, He built it like that. And it distinguishes it from the way that He created man's spirit. He breathed into man. So I want you to imagine this, if you will. He made this form, however He made it, this human body, and fascinating it is fearfully and wonderfully made we are. The systems of our bodies are astounding sometimes. And the more we learn, the more we recognize the <laughs> precision 
with which our body operates. And so God created man, and then God took man's body, and He breathed into him the breath of life. Now, I think when it says He breathed into him the spirit of life, God created man just like He created everything else. He spoke him into existence. He took from within and expressed it and spoke it into Adam, and Adam's body became alive because of the spirit that God had spoken into him. And what was it that he spoke? Well, we don't know, but we do know this. God said in verse 26 of chapter 1, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion. So God spoke dominion into him. God spoke uh, seed time and harvest into him. He told him to be fruitful, to multiply, subdue the earth, so forth. So he's speaking to him out of his own heart, and man becomes this living spirit human being. Glory to God. Now, in verse, um, in chapter 3, we come to the fall of man. Let's, let's just read the first seven verses. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read these first three words, it just makes me mad. First three uh, verses, it makes me mad. It makes me mad that this woman even talked to him. What is she doing listening to him and talking to him? Well, I guess she's doing the same thing that we do when we listen to him and talk to him and let him talk to us. So we can't fault her too bad, but it sure would have been nice if she'd have stood her ground. All right, now, verse 4, the, woman, the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And that makes me mad too. But that's all right, I'll get over it. Verse 7, although I may be standing by, a, friend, a, a, a minister friend of mine told me one time that the first thing he's going to do when he gets to heaven is he's going to jack slap Adam. I'm going to be close enough to watch and see if it happens. I don't know. <laughs> Verse 7, The eyes of them both were open. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. Now notice that phrase, they were naked. They saw that they were naked. Now, to me, this is a terrific argument against evolution. The fact that Adam and Eve were naked. Why? Because everything else in, in creation, every other animal, clothes itself from the inside. Birds grow feathers. Now they may not have it when they're born, but they'll grow feathers, protection. You don't have to, it, it's only, the, it's only the, uh, the animals that we've bred and changed that have to be protected so often. You know, they'll tell us when a big freeze comes along, get your pets inside. Well listen, that may be true if you've got a, a Pekingese or something, but if you had a wolf, it wouldn't be a problem. That wolf is well protected against the elements. See? All, the, all the animal kingdom is protected against the elements. And even the few ex exemptions of that that don't have their own fur or feathers or armor or protection, they know how to get it. A hermit crab will crawl into a shell, you know, and, 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 uh, and it'll be protected. But here's Adam after the fall, and he's naked. Now the implication there is defenseless. He's, he's, he's vulnerable. He's defenseless. He's, he's, he's without, without protection. See? That's a perfect, to me, testimony to creation. Because here's a man, how could he have evolved and become like that? When everything else so-called evolved and became self-reliant. Now another thing it is, it's a perfect illustration of the fact that there is a real thing called original sin. Because when God created Adam, I submit to you, and again, 
I don't have scripture for this. I, actually, I do, but you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's uh, things that I, I see. You may not see it quite as clearly as I do. But on the other hand, you don't have scripture against it. So we're going to go back to Adam's creation. God fashioned his body out of the elements of the ground, took him, stood him up face to face, spoke to him, spoke life into him. The Spirit of God created a, a human spirit here, and Adam became a living soul and a, and, a, and a speaking spirit like God. Now, when God created Adam at that moment, God did clothe him. He was not naked. Adam and Eve did not walk around in the Garden of Eden like Tarzan and Jane. You understand that? They didn't, they, they didn't, they weren't walking and, and avoiding the prickly uh, 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 cactus and, the, and, the, and, and sharp stones and all that. These people were clothed from within like the rest of the animal kingdom, but the difference between them and the animals were that they were a spirit in God's category and they were clothed with God's glory. Adam was a flame of fire when he walked around the Garden of Eden. If you had, been a, if you had seen him from your perspective, from, from this, you know, uh, our, our fallen condition and what our eyes can see now, if you had seen him, you would not have seen his body. You would not have seen his nakedness. You would have seen glory. Now, the Lord said this to me years ago, and I've always been a student of, you know, the, the beginning and the end. I, I, I studied extensive and have studied for many years of Genesis and sought to understand certain things. And then, of course, I'm very interested in what's coming. The Lord said this to me probably 40 years ago. He said, son, if you want to know the beginning, look to the end. And if you want to know the end, look to the beginning. Because I created it a certain way, I'm going to restore it a certain way. And so what it shall be is what it was. Amen. Earth was a mirror image of heaven. It was, a, it was a copy of heaven, all right? This planet is unique in all the universe. They've never found another planet like Earth as far as they've looked and as hard as they've tried. Every now and then you'll hear, well, they, they found traces of water somewhere, but they've never found anything that even resembles Earth in all the, all the years and all the, uh, you know, using the expensive technologically advanced equipment that they have. There's no other Earth out there. God created this planet as a mirror image of heaven. And God created man in his own image. Now let me ask you this. Do you really think that if you could see God, he'd be naked? Huh? Look at Jesus in the book of, of Revelation in the first chapter where he appeared to John. John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. <clears throat> he was praying and he heard a voice behind him. And it was a voice that sounded like thunder in many waters. And he turned around and he saw Jesus. And what did Jesus look like? He described him like this. His head and hair were white like wool. Now he wasn't talking about gray headed. He wasn't talking about it. He's talking about his head, his, his, his head, his countenance was so glorified that he shone. Jesus' hair is not gray from age. You understand that, what I'm saying? But he's glowing. And so he looks white like wool. And he's got this, <clears throat> he's got this aura about him. He's clothed with glory. Now certainly there are clothes that are described and so forth. But Adam is clothed with the glory of God in his original state. And when he walked, when he walked, Every living creature knew it. Every living creature, <laughs> I mean, yeah, they paraded before him and he named them, gave them their names and so forth. And, and uh, he's, he's exercising his dominion. So when, and, and, and here's another thing. The Bible talks about when Adam did sin, and when he did fall, God came looking for him came in the afternoon. The implication there is, and the indication is there, that he and God fellowshiped together prior to this. They walked face to face. Well, now, wait a minute. 
Moses cried out one time and said, Lord, I got to see your face. God said, it's not possible. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to put you in the cleft of a rock over here. I'm going to put my hand over you. And when I pass by, I'll take my hand off and you can see my hinder parts. You can see my back. But no man can look at my face and live. And yet Adam did. Why? Because Adam's clothed with that same glory. We're talking about two glorified beings face to face fellowshipping. And Eve being the third one. So when Adam sinned, when Eve sinned, that's what they lost. The day that thou eatest thou thereof, thou shalt surely die, the scripture said. God told him. But he didn't die physically. Adam lived nearly another thousand years. And he didn't die in the sense of his spirit's gone because he still functions in the earth. What died? What it's talking about there is spiritual death, which is a disconnection from God. When you are connected with God, you are spiritually alive. Spiritual death is to disconnect from God. You still exist. You'll exist eternally. You'll just exist separated from God. In spiritual, in eternal spiritual death. All right? So Adam walked face to face with God. Communed face to face with God. He could not have done that had he not been glorified as God was. Now when you get to see him, you'll be all right. Because you've got that same glory in you. And the time's coming when the veil's going to be lifted and we'll all, we'll all see each other in a whole different light. <laughs> Are you listening to me? So this is, the, this is the back story. This is what's going on in the earth, in the Garden of Eden. And uh, they lost this and they're separated from God. So notice what happened. Again in verse 7, <clears throat> the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. All right, they made aprons. So what we see here in verse 7 is the first attempt at religion. It's man's effort to cover himself and to cover his, his nakedness, to cover his vulnerability, to cover his, his, his weakness and so forth. Now, we read on down. We don't have time to read the whole thing, but let's go on down and look at verse 21. This is after God has told them what they've done and what it's going to bring into their lives. And he says, it says in verse 21, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now, again, we've got to fill in the blanks here with the rest of the Scripture. Because this narrative, this, this story of creation, it just hits the high spots. And much of what we know is revealed to us later on. But here's what we do know. God is showing them in verse 21 that man cannot cover himself. Only through the shedding of innocent blood would they be covered. And this is the underlying truth of chapter 4 where we find the story of Cain and Abel. God himself teaching them that by the shedding of blood, innocent blood, only would they be covered. Leviticus 17, 11 tells us the life of the flesh is in the blood. They lost the life of God and now then they're trying to weave together these leaves. Where do you get leaves? Leaves come from trees. <laughs> and God is showing them it's not going to work. We're going to have to use a different tree. And of course they did. All these things point to Jesus and to His blood. God told the serpent in the beginning, the seed of the woman will crush your head. You'll bruise his heel, he'll crush your head. Everything God does from the very beginning is pointing to Jesus and to the blood. Now fig leaves, they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. What are fig leaves? Well fig leaves can be a lot of things. Fig leaves can be religious exercises and practices. Fig leaves can be philanthropy, they can be ordinances and rules, they can be Personal efforts can be altruism. Uh, fig leaves can even be going to church. Are you listening to me? Yeah. All of these things are in direct conflict with Jesus Christ apart from His blood. But now you take the blood 
and apply the blood, then all of these things become wonderful. But in substitute for the blood, how many people have you encountered over the years and still do? I mean, you still run into folks today that talk about um, being good or being bad, being the deciding, you know, flipping the, the scale one way or another on whether you make it in. You couldn't do enough good to make one gnat's worth of difference. On the other hand, you couldn't do enough evil to make one gnat's worth of difference. I hear people from time to time, you hear it in, you know, just different places. Well, there's got to be a special place in hell for a person that does something like that. Well, <laughs> I got news for you. There may be a special place in hell, but it has nothing to do with what that person did. You don't go to hell for what you do. You go to hell for who you are. Maybe I could say it like this. You go to hell for what you do with Jesus. Nobody goes to hell for bad deeds. A person winds up in hell because they do not receive what Jesus has done. Now on the other hand, the other side of that coin is, nobody goes to heaven because they do good. Only one thing that will get you to heaven, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? So basically you got two trees you got to deal with. You think about them, there's a lot of comparisons. The curse was linked to a tree. Obviously the first curse came about because of this tree. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, and cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. But there's another tree. This tree in Genesis was one that was pleasant to the eyes. The Bible speaks of another tree as having no, be no beauty. This tree was forbidden. The other tree, the tree that Jesus hung on, we're commanded to eat of it. This tree, Satan enticed the woman to partake of. The other tree, the cross that Jesus hung on, Satan resists anybody coming to it. This tree in Genesis chapter 3 brought sin and death. The other tree, the tree that Jesus hung on, brings life and salvation. Now, chapter 3 verse 24, notice what it says here. It says, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. I want to, I want to point something out here to you really is, is kind of a little sidetrack, but I find it very interesting. The intent here is not as I've read it for many years, an effort to keep man out and away from this tree. What God is saying here, if you compare it with, for instance, Exodus chapter 25 and verse 22. Let me read this to you. And this is just one, one place where he is referenced this way. Exodus 25, 22, God speaking to Moses and to the children of Israel. Verse 21, you shall put the mercy seat above the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all the things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Notice God talks about communing with His people between the cherubim above the mercy seat. Now we, we know this, this is where God met the high priest every year. Amen. And so I want you to compare that with what it sees here. I believe God's not talking about keeping man away from the tree. I think what He's saying is He's protecting, notice the last phrase of that, of that 24th verse, to keep the way of the tree of life. He's protecting the way to that tree. Amen. It's very interesting if you go to the book of Acts, a number of different references, but in, for, well, Acts chapter 14 verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. 
Then throughout the book of Acts, four different references I've got written down here, chapter 9, verse 2, chapter 16, verse 17, and others, the early Christianity was called the way. The way. Jesus said, I am the way. God put these cherubim here to protect the way or to keep the way. Again, another reference here to Jesus. Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. Now, let's get up here to chapter 4 and look at Abel for a minute. It says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now, <clears throat> just a little nugget I've dug up uh, studying these things. Doesn't really mean anything one way or another, but some uh, of the rabbis believed that Cain and Abel were twins, that they were both born at the same time. As I say, it doesn't really matter, but Cain was the older of the two, and then came Abel. And then in verse um, uh, 2, once again, it says, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now, don't let their vocation influence you here. I think most of the time it does. You just automatically think, okay, Abel was a farmer. He was a, I mean, uh, Abel was a, a shepherd and, and he was a farmer. And so they just kind of did what they did because that's what they did. You know, the sacrifice that they brought, that was just the result of their, their vocation. It doesn't have anything to do with that because we read over in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, by faith, Abel did something. Now remember this, what is faith based on? Bible faith is always based on what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. What was it? The Word. Everybody say the Word. Amen. Remember what the Scripture says in uh, Romans chapter 10? For, uh, uh, in, in uh, wait a minute, Romans, uh, what am I thinking of here? Uh, yeah, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word. All right, so when we talk about faith, we can never separate it from the Word. Faith is not just what somebody feels like somebody wants to do. Bible faith is always based on the Scripture. You've got a scriptural basis for Bible faith. Amen. Now, don't be confused by their vocations. There's something else working here that by faith Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. Hold your place here in Genesis, if you will, and go with me to the Gospel of Luke. And look at the 11th chapter. Luke chapter 11. And I'll read verse 49, 50, and 51. Luke eleven forty nine. 49, Wherefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. Verse 51, From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you it shall be required of this generation. Notice how it calls Abel a prophet. It references Abel. I, I suppose he was the first prophet. But it calls him a prophet here. So we go back to Genesis and we read, She bare Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now verse 3, In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Now, what we see here in chapter 4 is not what they did for a living. It's not the fact that Abel was a shepherd and Cain was a farmer. Here's the thing. Everything that they needed to know was established in chapter 3. The worship of God 
was understood by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. I think when we read about particularly the more ancient ones of these people, I don't know about you, but maybe there's a tendency to, 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 to uh, make stick figures out of these people. That they, 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 weren't, they weren't advanced and sophisticated like what we're used to, and maybe even some of the more recent uh, uh, scriptural characters and whatnot. That we, we just kind of make them like the paintings on the cave walls, the cavemen paintings, you know, the, the stick figures. But you have to understand that when God created Adam, Adam was quite possibly the most beautiful man that ever lived. And I say that in a manly way, you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> now John Osteen said that Adam was five foot seven and had red hair. Because John Osteen was five seven and had red hair. But Adam, seriously, Adam was the, was the most magnificent creature perhaps to have ever been born. Now, I, I, I mean no disrespect to Jesus. He probably was right up there with him, you know, as far as his looks, as far as being a, a specimen of manhood. But Adam, Adam was a man. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't some kind of a, there, there was nothing weak or, or, or effeminate or, or anything like that about him. And Eve, she was, she was a knockout. She was. God, God built her. And that's why people today will refer to a beautiful woman as, boy, she's really built. Because God built Adam and made her beautiful. And, and so these, these people, they, they knew God before the fall. They, they knew, they understood worship. And they communicated these things to their children. Now we read about Cain and we read about Abel. Cain was the firstborn, then came Abel. But we don't know how long the span was in all these things that we're reading. Because we find out that after Cain kills his brother, he goes out and his children build cities. And, and, and that means that there were other people there. And where did these other people come from? They came from Adam and Eve. But Adam and Eve were commanded to be fruitful and multiply. They were very prolific. And there was a lot of humanity that came around quickly. Some Bible scholars say that in the days of, of Cain, there could have been, uh, you know, several hundred thousand people already on the planet. But you understand, we're talking about people lived a thousand years. And so there's a, there, there's, there's a lot going on that we don't read about. And that's the reason I say, don't look at them as just two-dimensional. Realize that these people had lives and they, they were not unsophisticated. Adam was brilliant. Adam operated on 100% mental power and as well as spiritual power in his, in his prime, if you will, before the fall. So understand that these people were not ignorant. They weren't cavemen. They weren't, they weren't, uh, uh, they, they weren't ignorant people. They weren't savages. These were very knowledgeable people. And God had taught Adam and Eve worship and what it meant. And Adam and Eve taught their children the same thing. Now in chapter, again in chapter 4 here, verse 5, Abel brought his offering, which was the firstling of the flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Cain brought his offering which was the fruit of the ground, and God had not respect. Let me ask you a question. How did they know? <laughs> Who? How did Cain and Abel know that Cain offering, that God had no respect to it, and Abel, he did? You ever thought about it? What kind of communication is going on here? What, what makes them know? I mean, you stop and think about it. When you take your offering to the bucket, do you know that your offering is accepted? Well, you probably do because, you know, you're, you're walking, you're, you're doing what you do by faith. But, you know, there are those that struggle with that. 
I mean, is, is my offering accepted? Is, is this pleasing unto God? And some people try to buy their way into things knowing that their offerings aren't accepted. But, but there's no sign of that. How about here? How did Abel know his offering was accepted? How did Cain know that his was not? Well, now I can't prove this, but I do have some scriptural um, corroboration here. There were times, and I count six other times in the Old Testament, where an offering was received by God and the fire fell. It happened with Gideon. It happened with Samson's parents. It happened with David. It happened with Solomon. It happened, probably the most well-known incident was Elijah on Mount Carmel, where he withstood the prophets of Baal and they soaked the bull down and, and put it on the altar. And then God answered by fire. So it's possible, maybe even probable, that God answered this offering by fire. And then Cain, of course, was angry. God asked him in verse 6, why is your countenance fallen? Why are you angry? And he said in verse 7, if you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do not well, then sin lieth at the door, and under thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. What he's saying here to him is, look, if you do well, you'll be accepted too. And if you don't, there's an offering to take care of sin because the, the Jews always, you know, they, they would interpret that scripture as there's always an offering for every sin. God provided that for his people. All right. So something happened to indicate to him and then God in a loving way invited Cain, get it right. I mentioned a while ago that Adam was a beautiful man Eve was a beautiful woman. That's the way God created them. You know they were. You don't have to have chapter and verse to know that. Well, what would their children have looked like? What would Cain, the firstborn son, have looked like? He also must have been a magnificent person. Let me tell you something. I, uh, as I've looked at these things, I've, I've kind of rethought some things. I don't know about you, but I think a lot of people have a very negative view of Cain. Because after all, he was the first murderer and whatnot. But uh, it, it may be that Cain was no worse than anybody else. He was just hard-headed and stubborn. Like I say, he had to have been a prize physical specimen. Not only that, but he was their firstborn. And you know the rule of the firstborn in the Word of God, in the lineage of humanity, how that he was actually in line for the firstborn share of everything in those days. And so God is inviting him, come on now, let's get this right. But the word was out. And God had established what was worship and what was not and what worked and what did not. And Adam and Eve had tried to cover themselves with the fruits of the ground, if you will. And he made it clear that won't work. It's only the shedding of innocent blood. Can you say amen? amen? In some way, when they offered these sacrifices, God made it obvious. Now, let's go back over to Hebrews chapter 11. Wrap it up. Are y'all getting anything tonight? Yes, sir. I like some of these, I like some of the backstory to these things. I find it very interesting. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. It was the sacrifice, not the character that was highlighted, okay? Didn't say that Cain was an evil person. As a matter of fact, God protected him even after he had killed his brother. 
So it's not talking about character here. It's talking about the sacrifice. The difference between Abel and Cain was simply this. Abel gave it God's way, or did it God's way. He acted on God's word. And when we come to the end of the story, that's the way it'll always be. Faith acts on God's word. This is what witnessed of Abel's righteousness. His faith, not the blood. The blood pointed to something. But that blood could not do anything for him. That blood could not save him. That blood could not cleanse him. The blood simply was a type of something to come. It was his faith. Or we could say it like this. It was Abel's acting on the Word of God that made the difference in his life. And that's always what it's going to be. So we've seen earlier on, in God's case, that faith speaks. And now then, in the case of Abel, faith acts. Amen. Faith is speaking God's Word. Faith is acting on God's Word. And it is faith that caused him, that, that gave him the witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts. But Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24, speaks of the blood of Jesus, the blood of a, of a new covenant, the blood of sprinkling, that speaks better things than that of Abel. Amen. So I close tonight and leave you with that. We've, we've got something far better than Abel had, and yet at the same time, it's still testifying about him. Just imagine what acting on the Word of God and highlighting and exalting the blood of Jesus and trusting that blood will do for you and me. Amen. Praise the Lord.